This right here is a full keg of AI generated hazy IPA. We've brewed it, we've kegged it, and in a minute we're gonna taste it. But first we're gonna show you how ChatGPT told us to make it. It's brew day. Welcome back, brewers and beer lovers, to Flying Wombat TV, the channel all about beer, banter, and bloody good times. And today, we are back for a rematch with ChatGPT. So it is another of our mini series of Man vs Machine, number two this time. So if you guys weren't here with us last time, uh, we did a uh, ChatGPT version of a West Coast IPA, one of my IPAs, we put them to the test and sadly the AI robot won. So I've been wanting a rematch for quite a while now and we figured what better one to do than a hazy IPA this time around. Maybe the fruitier, sweeter style of IPA is more my speed and maybe I can actually beat the machine this time. Before we get cracking into this series, we need to find out what ChatGBT has in store for us as a recipe. So we're gonna jump in here and punch in. Make me a hazy IPA beer recipe for a 23 litre batch in metric units, sorry Americans, including brewing salts water profile. I know I worded that kind of weirdly, but I just wanted to be very, very clear to the AI that I need the water chemistry for this one because we're introducing that into our videos now. So especially for a hazy IPA, you can really boost that juicy profile depending on the water chemistry. Now let's have a little looksies at this. I'm curious about what the hop schedule is gonna be. So we are, wow, okay. So it's just gonna be Citra and Mosaic. I really thought that there was gonna be a few other hops floating around in this one, interesting. A decent amount of flaked oats, about 13% of the grist, that makes sense. That's gonna give us our body and our creaminess. Regular pale malt for the rest of the grist and wheat, yep. And then a little bit of Munich malt, interesting. I wouldn't have thought Munich for a hazy style. That's more of like a West Coast in my opinion. Okay, in any case, scrolling down a little bit, let's get to the yeast. London Ale 3 or Vermont Ale Yeast, yep, both good choices. Water profile, this is what I've been curious about. Wow, okay, not the way that I'm gonna be going. So they're going for a, oh, sorry, no, I'm absolutely blind. I was reading calcium as chloride. So they're going 200 parts per million of chloride, 150 parts per million of sulfate. So that's about a 0.75 ratio, give or take. I'm gonna be doing the opposite. I'm gonna be going a full one to two ratio of sulfate to chloride, so yes. I am going to hope that that's my little bit of a secret weapon to give me a juicier, more full-bodied style of hazy. Alrighty, looks like I need to buy a couple of ingredients, so we are going to be back soon, and next you're going to see me when it's time to kick off our brew day. See you in a minute. I am back, but full disclosure, I was able to buy most of the ingredients. I could not, however, buy the exact yeasts that ChatGPT was recommending, so... In the interest of keeping everything fair and reasonable for my recipe versus the ChatGPT recipe, we are both going to be using Lalmand East Coast, uh, American East Coast Ale Yeast. So a New England uh, uh, IPA style of yeast. It's the best alternative I could find within the time frame that we wanted to film this, and it's a pretty decent yeast that I've used a few times. So if we're both using the same yeast, then all things fair in love and war, right? Now for the all important salt profile. I know that we already said it when ChatGPT made the recipe for this particular beer, but because of real world logistics, I'm not using RO water, I'm using tap water. There's only so much I can do, but I did my very best to keep it as close to what ChatGPT wanted as possible. And more importantly, I kept that um, chloride to sulfate ratio the same. So with that being said, it is 143 parts per million calcium, 20 parts magnesium, 15 sodium, 199 chloride, 150 sulfate, and 57 parts per million of bicarbonate. We also added 1.7 mils of phosphoric acid into the mash and 0.48, so half a mil into the uh, sparge water as well. As with any brew day, it all starts with a good milling. But quick disclaimer, if you're new to brewing IPAs or, sorry, New England IPAs or using oats in general, this stuff does not go through a grain mill. So if you're going to be using oats, keep that separate and add it to the mash tun once the rest of your grains have already been crushed. Like all of this good stuff here. This is fine to go in the mill. So we're gonna whack all of this in. 
And I'm running my mill at about a one millimeter gap. So basically the width of a credit card between the rollers. Do what you need to do to make it work for your grain mill. They're all slightly different, but that's a generally pretty good starting place. Let's get cracking. It is now okay to add all of our oats and our rice hulls in with a little help of a trusty mash paddle. So you could just do this when you're actually going into the mash itself, but I've got all the ingredients ready now, so why not just add them and mix them all together now and save myself a little bit of uh, extra work when we start throwing this in the strike water. Give it a good mix and you're good to get to mashing. Before we finally start mashing in for this brew day, I do want to add all of my salts and make sure that they are fully dissolved. So as I start heating up my mash tun to get everything cracking, let's actually open up the, um, you know, the pipe, the uh, recirculation, that might help. I'm gonna make sure this stuff all gets fully dissolved so that we are making full use of this water salts profile. That should do it. Um, I guess we'll be back in a second to start mashing in with our strike water. We are gonna be mashing in for one hour at 66 degrees Celsius for this beer. All the uh, you know Imperial slash Freedom units are gonna be popping up all over the screen. Um, and there is gonna be a 10 minute mash out, which has a slight, you know, couple minute lag time. So what that means is um, we're gonna raise the temperature of this mash at the end of mashing up to 77 degrees Celsius. That basically stops all the enzyme activity so that all the uh, sugars stop getting broken down into more digestible compounds for the yeast so that we do actually have some body left in this beer. Wow, that paint mixer does a, uh, a right quick job on a brew vessel of this scale. <laughs> Whirlpool. It can actually fit in there. Yeah, there we go. Easier than trying to squeeze that, uh, the big oversized mash paddle into the baby Brewzilla. <laughs> All right, let's add some more in. I have high hopes for mine this time around. I think, honestly, genuinely, I think I'll save most of the commentary for when we taste them, but I think ChatGBT has made a couple of mistakes in its recipe. Munich malt. I've never made a Nipa with Munich malt. That seems like a very bizarre choice to me. Munich malt I would reserve for something like a German style lager or for obviously heavier, darker beers or like brown ales, that kind of thing. It seems what like about, a really... What about the mouthfeel? My mouthfeel should be creamier. So you'll see all this in the video next week where we'll go through my recipe, but my recipe has got a lot more oats and a lot more wheat. And I believe that's going to give you a much silkier, much more full bodied Nipah, which is going to lend way more into that juicy style of beer than what this one does. This has got plenty of wheat and plenty of oats. Mine's just got a lot more, so I think mine's gonna have better mouthfeel. And then mine, spoilers, has a little secret weapon, which I'll talk about in the next video. We are gonna run into a small issue here. This Brewzilla is not really designed for this amount of grain, which I suppose, good time to mention, it's seven and a half kilos, uh, eight kilos including the half kilo or 500 grams of rice hulls. This Brazil is not really designed to take that much. So this is gonna be a little bit of an effort to cram all of this in. See how we go. Had to resort back to the mash paddle to try and squash everything down a bit more before I blitz it. Cause we don't have enough room left. I am struggling to fit all the grain in. So I'm gonna do something similar that I did with the um, Christmas stout, the gingerbread one, tag up there. I'm gonna drain out some of the liquid, some of the wort from here, some of the early wort, so that it drops the level of the entire grain bed. Then I can fit in the rest of the grains, then I can pour this back over top because this thing is just not designed <laughs> to hold this much grain. It's struggling. Hmm. You don't fit, sir. You know what I'm realizing what we are making here? We're turning into baristas because we're making some A-grade oat milk. Coffee? <laughs> Finally, we got there. We have actually managed to squeeze in all of this grain, if only barely. Um, just leave that there for now. So I'm gonna put on the top filter and we're gonna start recirculating this mash. Let's get that over there. And oh, it does not wanna go down any further than that. Let me put the pipe stopper on. 
and we are good. I can now start recirculating this as well as adding back all of our oat milk. Nice, creamy. Okay, we're gonna let this recirculate over the course of the next hour and we will see you back when it's time to start sparging. Mash is done and now we're gonna lift up our malt pipe and start sparging. This is, oh, it's not too heavy. Okay, cool. Nice working with the baby, uh, the baby mash ton every now and then because it's just so much lighter than the big boy. Oh man, it's gonna splash on me. There we go. All right, we're sweet. We are sweet. Okay, over in this tub right here, we have all of our sparge water heated up and ready. So this is sitting at 78 degrees Celsius and it's already been filled up with its phosphoric acid and various salts so that the salt water chemistry profile matches that of which we put in here, just different volumes, obviously. We're gonna start pouring this over top of here as this grain bed dry, drains out and then we'll be back to start our boil. We are not boiling just yet because I almost forgot we need to add our first wort hops. ChatGPT told us to add 30 grams of citra before the boil had actually started. Idea behind this is it's meant to give a softer bitterness, a more rounded style of, um, of IBUs for a kind of softer Nipah style of beer. So this is all going in. And this, by the way, is partly where I think ChatGPT might have made a mistake and I've made a mistake trying to get them in. Go, go. Because 30 grams of citra this early in a batch this size, that seems like a lot. It's pretty bitter. We'll see how it turns out. All right, we are boiling. That is really nowhere near as much volume as, um, as I expected. That's sitting at about 21, two, sitting at about 22 liters of wort at the moment. So you guess after boil off, we'll probably end up with about 20 liters. Let's take a quick gravity reading and find out where we're at. Uh, by the way, the next hop addition for this one is gonna be at the 15 minute mark where we're gonna add a further 30 grams of citra. It is at 1.061 currently. So yeah, Brewfather I think was way off. Brewfather was predicting that this would be like an eight and a half percent IPA, which sounded a bit nutty. Um, I reckon it's gonna be more like 7% at best. But yeah, we'll come back when it's time to add the boil hops. Now it's time to add our um, aroma hops for the first round of aroma hops. So again, that is, oh my God, I just got splashed. <laughs> Bloody hell. That is 30 grams of citra, 15 minutes left in the boil, as well as um, our whirl flock to you know, it's not really necessary to be super clear with a Nipah, obviously, but I still like to start with as clear a word as possible before it gets all hazy. Anyway, that's done. In 15 minutes, we're gonna start cooling this thing down to uh, 80 degrees Celsius, and then we'll add the rest of our Whirlpool hops. See you then. Boil has now finished. We're gonna start whirlpooling this bad boy, cooling it down to 80 degrees Celsius, at which point we're gonna add the rest of our aroma hops, which are, 50, 60 grams each of citra and mosaic. So I'm gonna whack that in for 20 minutes and then we'll cool this down for yeast pitching temperature. <laughs> we just had a little nip of whiskey and it's just <clears throat> burning down my throat at the moment. Hops. So yeah, I already said how many hops, didn't I? Let's just add them. Let's just add them. There we go. Let all that stuff settle in for the ride. After 20 minutes of this, we will pitch yeast. We are now whirlpooling and cooling down because our um, 20 minutes has passed. So it's as good a time as any to take a little gravity reading and find out what we're working with here. That is a lot of troop in there. Holy cow. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, we are sitting at 1.076. So, no, oh, actually that could be close to 8%, depending on how dry this finishes. It'll be at least seven. My guess is seven and a half, but it could be a bit higher than that, depending on its final gravity. So um, chat GBT might not have been that wrong after all. We're gonna cool this down to yeast pitching temperature and then whack them in. Are we good? Yes. We're ready to start transferring into the Keg King Snub Nose Apollo fermenter. So we are gonna 
use this, the reason I'm using this one is because there's a chance we might need to pressure ferment if the temperature gets too high. Obviously, I don't have any temp control on this, but pressure fermenting can negate some of the issues that you get when you ferment a little bit too hot. There is gonna be a massive trub cone at the bottom of this fermenter. Come have a look at this, have a look in there. <laughs> there is so many hops in terms of grams per liter because of how little volume there was in this thing. So if this beer tastes really bad, it might actually be me that screwed it up and not the recipe. <laughs> the mash efficiency was horrifically bad. Now, I don't really know about this recipe because we wound up with 18 liters in the fermenter. Part of that might have been my brewing mistakes. Part of it is that there is a lot of oat and stuff in there. I don't think ChatGPT accounted for it, how much absorption there would be, but whatever is what it is. Time to pitch our yeast. We are going to attempt to ferment at 25 degrees Celsius, but obviously I don't have temperature control on this particular fermenter vessel. So what I'm gonna do is let this thing ride and just monitor the temperature intermittently. If it starts to get too hot, I'll whack on the, uh, whack the pressure up, so it ferments under pressure. If it starts to get too cold, I can whack a heat belt on it. But 25 degrees Celsius is the goal here. I will see you guys when I um, dry hop this bad boy. So this is only our first dry hop edition that we're gonna be throwing into this beer. And uh, as you notice, I got it in a little dry hop bag because we're gonna be doing two different dry hops. So I don't want these hops to have too much contact time for too long inside the beer and then get weird grassy off flavors. Here's the issue though. The whole idea behind two dry hop additions is that normally the first one is when fermentation is still pretty active. This is only day three. I've just checked the gravity. It's sitting at 1.012. So we're basically hit final gravity already. Uh, that's very, very fast for fermentation, especially considering how high the gravity was on this beer before um, we started fermenting. So damn it, <laughs> we kind of missed the ideal window to do this first hop addition, but no matter, we're still gonna carry on with the recipe as it's told us to do. So I'm gonna quickly open the top here, drop these bad boys in, and then close this up so that we don't get too much oxygen exposure. And I also do have a magnet sitting inside this hop bag so that I can actually raise it out of here when it's time. Let's pop that in. All right. Probably should have magnetized that first and then slid it in. Ah, uh, I think things through like 90% of the way. And then I don't think about the last little bit. I'll figure that out later. I'll play fishing with the magnet. I'm gonna close this up and whoops. <laughs> I'm gonna close this up and then I will be back when it's time for that final hop edition in about three days from now, two to three days from now. So I'll see you in a second. It's now time for our final dry hop. And I did eventually actually finish the, fish the little, the bag with the magnet. It took a little bit of swishing with the fermenter to like get it to the side so I could magnet it. But anyway, I got there eventually. It was just a bit annoying. I am gonna pop this off and throw this last hop addition in nice and quick. All right, let's take you off, unscrew this. Oh, that's tight, okay. And it's looking very murky at the moment, but it did clear up quite a lot right up until I took that other hot bag out not too long ago. So it's all kind of going back into suspension. Let's do this smarter this time. How am I gonna do this? That's about to pop off. Uh, I guess I'm gonna hold it like that. Not be quite so silly. Come on, there we go. And yes, we're cooking with gas now. Go down to the side. Nice, let's screw you back on top. And it's like that mistake never happened the first time. Sweet. All right, that is finished. Let's plonk that back on. By the way, I've seen a few people using this particular fermenter or fermenter similar to it and putting the uh, pressure relief valve on the beer outline for the dip tube. Just remember, black is beer, gray is gas. That's typically the color of the O-rings on these things. You can tell the difference because I've seen a few videos of people doing that. Then they wake up the next morning, come down to their garage and they find this beer everywhere because as the pressure built from fermentation, it pushed out all the beer out the dip tube, out the gas outlet. So be careful if you're gonna use stuff like this. That is that. I'm now gonna let this ramp up to 15 PSI, followed by 
Well, I can't cold crash with this thing, but followed by kegging it once it's all clarified and settled up a little bit, then I'll make sure it's fully pressurized and ready to serve. So the next video you guys are gonna see is me making my man-made hazy IPA, my own personal recipe, which is gonna take on this bad boy right here. Then you'll get to see which beer was actually best. So until next time, guys, happy brewing. I'll see you on the next video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon.